All right. Um, hi, everybody. Welcome to our uh, latest edition of Chestnut Chat. Today, we're going to talk about pollen procedures. Um, I am Sarah Fitzsimmons. I'm the Chief Conservation Officer for the American Chestnut Foundation. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm in black and white because I dropped my laptop about two months ago and I haven't figured out how to get back in color. Um, but uh, yeah, so you get to enjoy me. This is film noir, Sarah. We'll see how long that lasts, either for a couple more months or perhaps years. Um, but uh, I am uh, happy to say we are joined by Hannah Pilkey from SUNY ESF, Eric Jenkins from TACF at Meadowview Farms, and Cassie Stark, who has recently accepted our Mid-Atlantic Regional Science Coordinator position out of Charlottesville, Virginia, but she was at Meadowview too as, as the uh, laboratory manager. So I uh, thank you guys for doing this talk. I know those of you who are expecting to see information about the documentary, we had a last minute shift just for, for timing, but uh, we're hoping to have the documentary Chestnut Chat next month in June. Um, so I wanna again, thank Hannah, Eric and Cassie for uh, putting this talk together so quickly so we could talk about pollen at a really um, a good time too. This is a great time to start thinking about pollen. I know the catkins in many areas have already started um, coming out. They're actually even out here in State College. They might've gotten zapped too. Um, Cassie, I think you said they were about five inches um, down oh. at Lasane. Yeah, they were big. Yeah, so so they're out. They probably won't um, start uh, shedding pollen here for, for a little bit unless you're really down south. Um, so we're going to talk about both pollen in the field and pollen in the high light chambers. Uh, and Hannah has been really uh, an amazing expert at um, uh, pioneering some of the techniques of getting pollen to flush really quickly and getting it stored and everything. A little bit of housekeeping. If you have a question, please put that in the q and A. I I see uh, a question is already in there. Uh, what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. That's correct. Um, although maybe more of a rhetorical question. Um, and then uh, if you have any, want to just chat with your fellow attendees, please put that in the uh, chestnut chat. Is it acceptable to take pictures? Absolutely. You can take pictures. You are being recorded. So if you put something in the chat, if you put something in the Q&A, it will be recorded. Obviously, Hannah, Eric, Cassie, Lisa, Kendra, we're all being recorded. We try to put this up um, on YouTube about a week after uh, it airs, although sometimes that gets uh, delayed a little bit. Um, I think that's it for housekeeping. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Lisa to give a little bit more information and to introduce, I think, are we starting with Cassie? Is yes. you're, you're starting the things out. Okay, so so Lisa, and then if you can introduce Cassie when you get a chance, that would be great. Sure, thank you, Sarah. It's great to be on Chestnut Chat again. Great participation out there in the hinterlands. And I uh, wanted to point out Russell Boyer. He's, I think, our perfect attendance Chestnut Chat um, attendee. I, I think he's, are you 12 now? Are you 10, 12? Can't remember, but he's our future. So thank you, Russell. Um, I don't have a lot to announce except, yes, the documentary film was premiered um, in April. It's six years in the making, so it's been quite the journey. Um, so you'll learn about it next month. I'm not going to be on that call because I'll be dedicating an orchard in honor of Rufin Van Boisette. Um, he is a longtime Massachusetts, Rhode Island stalwart volunteer, and um, we're naming an orchard after him in Westboro, Massachusetts at the Massachusetts Wildlife. So I won't be on that call, but Jules and Mari um, Peterson is our marketing outpost person. The film is really, we're really excited about it. It's been such a long haul to get it done, but we're still doing edits, final edits on it, getting permission from the Rolling Stones and um, Reuters and all kinds of weird places to, to be sure we're in compliance. But um, that's a very exciting time. You all know I'm going to be stepping down later this year. We have hired my successor, Dr. Will Pitt. I've had a really nice couple of conversations with him. I'm excited about his, his tenure and what he'll bring to the organization. So stay tuned on some of those transition issues. But it's business as usual for me. In fact, my travel schedule is going to be pretty intense the next few weeks, New York City tomorrow, Boston, Syracuse, hopefully, um, and the Carter Center weekend in Atlanta. So I'm I'm really hitting the road for, on my farewell tour and trying to close some, some gifts for the organization to give Will a good start. So that's all I had to say today. I'm not going to be able to help close out this talk, but want to congratulate Cassie for landing the Mid-Atlantic Regional Science Coordinator job. That's awesome. We're so proud of you and excited. And uh, Eric's our, our longtime veteran on the farm, so I'm sure he'll have some really great historic background. And Hannah, of course, is the talented 
person in SUNY ESF that is managing all this pollen stuff. So enjoy the pollen talk. Cassie, take it away. Thanks, everybody. Awesome. Thanks, Lisa. So mm -hmm. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And do like this. And let me close all of these things. Sorry, it's been a while since I've done like Zoom share screen. Okay. So um, as you all know by now, I'm Cassie. So I'm our the new Mid-Atlantic Regional Science Coordinator. So I'll be kicking off our talk and then Hannah will speak for a little bit and then Eric will follow up at the end. So we're gonna be talking to you today about everything pollen. So we're gonna start from the top. I'm gonna be talking about flower biology and terminology. So plants produce flowers as a means of reproduction. Right. So whether that be pollen production or in order to produce seed or fruit. So when we're talking chestnuts, we have our catkins, which are male flowers, and those are featured here on the left. Um, so you can see they're kind of long. They're like four to six inches long, just depends on the tree and the site. Um, and they get kind of, I don't know, I say they look kind of like fluffy um, and white when they're ready to pollinate. And then on the right, we have our female flowers, which are turned into our burrs on chestnuts. So once that flower is pollinated, uh, it'll form that spiky chestnut burr that we know, and then inside will be the chestnut seeds. So the goal for the female flower is to be pollinated, and the male flower wants to pollinate, produces their pollen. So chestnut species in trees are what are known as monoecious. So what that means is one house. So you can see on this photo here, I have arrows pointing to our uh, male catkin here, and then our little female flowers here, which are usually found on the tips of branches. So monoecious, meaning one house, is that our male and female flowers are found on the same tree or house. Um, and it's important to note that while these flowers are found on the same tree, um, they chestnuts can't self. So the catkin from this male catkin isn't going to be pollinating this female flower. And that's why they say it's important when you're planting chestnuts that you want to plant more than one tree, uh, especially obviously if you want to be getting seed because the tree can't pollinate itself. Okay, so now we'll be diving a little into some some pollen logistics here. So a little pollen 101. So I attached a photo here in the bottom left. So these are male catkins, probably what you're seeing right now in your orchards, uh, depending on where you're located, where the catkins are um, forming, but they're really early in their development. And what we use often is a term when catkins are ready to pollinate, we say, um, they're pushing out their anthers. So what that means is we'll get into a little bit of terminology here, is our anthers are where the pollen grains are actually being developed. So I'm assuming you can see my mouse. Um, so this long portion right here coming off of our chestnut flower, that's our filament. And then attached to that is our anther, which is this yellow portion on the top of this uh, kind of white stalk. And that's where I said that pollen's being produced. And then the whole thing, the anther and the filament together, is called the stamen. And so those are our male, female fl uh, flower parts. So American chestnut pollen, as I said, so they're born on the anthers of male, poll of male flowers. And pollen grains of American chestnut are really, really small. So you can think half of the width of a strand of your hair, which is honestly not even really imaginable. Very, very, very small. Um, and then chestnuts are wind and insect pollinated. And then this photo here is a zoomed in photo of what that uh, anther looks like on a chestnut. So why why are we having a 
a chestnut chat all about pollen. So pollen is critical for TACF's mission for chestnut restoration. So pollen is the carrier of genetic material of chestnuts are really plants in general. So pollen is the carrier of our genetic material. And for what we do for our breeding program, we're selecting trees that are performing the best, whether that be in blight tolerance, phytophthora resistance, or, you know, they look very American and we really like their form. Uh, and they have a lot of that Castanea dentata uh, ancestry. And so we want to be using these trees that are performing the best for our back cross breeding program. Um, and we want to be conserving their pollen for gen increased genetic diversity and also for our germplasm conservation orchards. And then also collecting and using these pollens, this pollen for our Darling 58 new transgenic tree that we're working on. So we only have a handful of those trees right now um, that, that we've created. And so it's really important to collect as much pollen as we can and use that for diversifying uh, the lineage of those trees. So our controlled pollinations are really important and pollination season's a, a big time, a very important time for us as a foundation for our mission as a whole. So how are we gathering our pollen and doing this? So I'm gonna be talking to you about um, collecting pollen from our highlight growth chambers. And then we also have highlight grow rooms where we're collecting pollen. And then I'm gonna pass it over and we're gonna talk about um, how we collect pollen directly from our trees outdoors. So um, for our Darling 58 trees, or our transgenic trees, we have, uh, this is at SUNY ESF, they have highlight growth chambers, and then we also use highlight grow rooms, which I'll talk a little bit about later. And essentially what we're trying to do is get these transgenic trees to flower quickly. So we're trying to induce male flowering, and we're doing this by cranking up the intensity of light and exposing these plants to a longer photo period. So for example, at Meadowview at our, in our highlight grow room, we're exposing um, our trees to a 16-hour photo period. And so what we're seeing is we're seeing trees begin to flower under a year and like as early as six months I had trees flower in our highlight grow room at Meadowview. And so, you know, in an orchard setting, we're looking at five to seven years for these trees to flower. So another benefit of these highlight uh, growth chambers is that we can be having pollen production and gathering pollen and storing it all year. Um, rather than just during you know pollination season we're not limited by just june when we're collecting pollen we can be collecting it year round so this is a photo of some catkins in bloom in the highlight growth chamber so you can see these trees are lots of flowers and then this is a photo like i was saying so we don't have a highlight growth chamber at meadowview but we have a, what we call a highlight grow room. And we also have one of these um, at Penn State. And then our partners at uh, University of New England also have a highlight grow room. So basically these are just high intensity UV lights and we've found a space um, actually just like in a storage room at Meadowview, but in greenhouses that are other location where we've put plants and we're trying to induce pollen production. So this is what we got going on at Meadowview. And I believe that is it for me. So I think I'm gonna be passing it on to Hannah. And Hannah, I don't know if you wanna share, be in control and share the screen, but I'm also happy to click for you if you want me to do that. You were muted, I'm sorry. I can share my screen. Okay, awesome. Looking good. Can we see it? Yes, yes. Cool. 
Thank you, Cassie, for doing the intro and background information on chestnut flower biology and also what the highlight growth chamber setups look like. Um, my name is Hannah. I have been with ESF. This will be going into my seventh year of doing chestnut pollinations. Um, I started um, as an undergrad and then for my master's work, um, we really need to figure out a way to be able to store our transgenic pollen. Nowadays, it's much more plentiful, especially since we have, you know, the folks at Meadowview and Tom Clack at UNE that contribute significantly to pollen production. But back many years ago, we had to figure out a way that we could collect pollen um, eloquently, not waste any of it. Um, and also make sure that um, when we store it in the freezer that it's maintaining its viability to be able to do pollinations. Um, as Cassie mentioned, we produce pollen all year round. So ideally, you know, we'd want the pollen to be um, blooming right around the pollinations. But of course, you know, it's good to have it all year round. So we would need to figure out kind of a, a long term storage method for um, collecting and freezing our pollen. So that's a little bit what I study. We'll be talking about that today. So we'll just go ahead and get into it. Here you can see the picture um, to the right that of what like a really good year looks like in the High Lake Growth Chamber. Tons of um, catkins in bloom and pollen ready to be collected. Um, it's not like this every year, unfortunately. This year, for instance, ESF had a really hard time battling spider mites. So again, it's great that you know our collaborators um, and other universities have high like growth chambers going too. And that way we can all kind of work together and make sure that we're covering our um, pollen production to be able to do our pollinations with the Darling 58 pollen. Um, so for instance, like Tom Clack, this year, he produced like thousands of vials of Darling 58 pollen that he'll be sharing with the people that have permits to do pollinations, which is really exciting. But we all follow the same kind of collection procedure for this pollen to keep things uniform and to keep our pollen viable. So I'll, start, I'll explain that here. Um, once the catkins are ready, we use a microscope slide to gather the chestnut pollen. This is kind of what it looks like um, once you've uh, collected the pollen, you take the length of the catkin and you just delicately kind of rub the um, pollen off onto the microscope slide. Um, it's kind of nice. It works well because pollen is slightly sticky to it. It has a little bit of like an adhesive quality. And also um, the microscope slides have a bit of static electricity to them. So they kind of like draw the pollen off onto the microscope slide, which is nice. So we go through and we um, collect the pollen um, very gently. Um, what's nice about the microscope slides is that um, since we're just handling it with the slides and not using our hands to kind of manually strip off the anthers with the pollen, um, only the pollen is collected on the slides. There's no, none of those accessory floral organs like the anthers and the filaments. So it makes it really nice for pollinating because it's, the pollen is very targeted onto the female flowers. And it's also nice because if we keep these catkins intact, um, they'll keep developing, they'll keep releasing pollen for like a week until they start to turn kind of golden brown. But if we leave the catkin on and only use the microscope slides and don't detach the catkin, we can keep going back and performing multiple pollen collections, which is really nice. So um, after the pollen has been collected on the microscope slides, we use these, um, screw top slide jars to store the uh, microscope slides in. Um, these are nice because they have that really tight seal from the screw top. Um, so it protects it well when it's in freezer storage. Um, anything that doesn't have a um, tight seal, it's gonna lose viability quickly because pollen is pretty delicate. Uh, with these slide jars, we can fit uh, four microscope slides in each slide jar. They're also nice because um, when we bring them out to the field, they're kind of, you know, protected. If you drop them off your ladder or out of your pocket, you know, the slides aren't going to go flying out. It's kind of like a nice little travel vessel, I guess. So we also like using these when we exchange pollen and send it in the mail. 
So after the pollen's been collected and put in these slide jars um, to uh, get the pollen ready for its term in the freezer, um, we have to uh, gently remove the water content from the pollen. This is pretty standard pollen collection material for pretty much any plant breeder that works with pollen. Um, as I mentioned, pollen is delicate. And it also, since it has water moisture content in it, if you were supposed to, if you were um, collecting fresh pollen and then you put it right into the freezer, that water inside the pollen could freeze quickly. And then the ice crystals within the pollen could damage the pollen at a cellular level. So to avoid that, we kind of want to um, extract the moisture from the pollen before it goes into the freezer. So we um, leave the slide jar slightly open, the caps on, but it's not screwed tightly. And then we place them into a container that holds about 250 grams of these desiccation rocks, which I have a picture of. They look like this. Um, these are nice because they'll start to turn like a pinkish purple color when they are saturated with moisture. And then you can bake them in the oven um, to get them to be able to absorb moisture again. Other people have used like those silica beads that you'd get when you're, when you're getting like packages and stuff. Um, I've heard those work well. I think some of our collaborators use those instead because they're easier to come by. Um, but desiccant is key. It'll, um, we leave our pollen for about 24 hours in the refrigerator in these presence of the desiccation rocks. Um, and then the uh, slide jar gets screwed tight after that time period. And then it gets put into a negative 20 degree Celsius freezer, or if you have it, a negative 80 degree Celsius freezer is good too. Negative 20 degrees Celsius is about equivalent to like a standard um, freezer that you'd have in your home. One thing to note is that if you um, are someone that's interested in collecting pollen or storing pollen of your own, um, having a non defrosting freezer is the best. It's the ideal because with, defro with defrosting freezers, they'll change their temperature um, occasionally to prevent ice and frost and stuff from building up, but that can mess with the pollen a little bit. Um, so it's ideal, it's not necessary. Your, your pollen isn't gonna get killed if you have it in a defrosting freezer. It just helps it uh, a little better, especially if you have a screw top vial, it'll be pr protected from those fluctuations in temperature. So this is kind of what our Darling 58 pollen storage looks like here at ESF. It starts to get a little bit crazy and then we have to go in and organize everything so that it makes it easy to distribute to our collaborators, people that are doing permitted pollinations. Um, this is our negative 80 freezer. You can see all that frost build up, which is, which is ideal. We store all of our pollen with the tree that it came from. We have an individual ID number for all of our pollen so we can see exactly when we collected it, who collected it, and any other pertinent information. Um, and then um, it stays here for as little as a few weeks if we're lucky and the pollen's been produced close to when the pollinations occur. But we have pollen that's been stored for over two years now. So it really depends. Um, their, their time in storage is can, can change. So some of it's really old and some of it we use right away, but these freezers help keep it viable and happy. Hey, Hannah, but, um, yep. I, I feel like this might be a good stopping point. Uh, do you mind if I ask you a few questions that have come in through Q&A? Yeah, of course. We, we've got we've got a nice built up build up of things. So yeah, yeah, please interrupt. Um, all right, great. So uh, Sim asks, why not just snip the catkin to capture all the pollen? And then Philip also asks, can catkins be removed from the branch and stored as a complete flower? So I think those two kind of go hand in hand. Um, we don't snip them off because we, as I mentioned, we like to do uh, multiple collections because as the anther, anthers age, they crack open and, and more mature pollen is released. Um, when this protocol was developed, we really had to conserve and wanted to get as much of the Darling 58 pollen um, collected and frozen as possible. So this is kind of like our most hands off, uh, most delicate way of collecting pollen, um, really not maneuvering the catkin too much in order to be able to get as much as it as much of it as we can onto the microscope slides to be able to use in the controlled pollinations. That changes, however, if you were collecting pollen from the fields. Um, which I'll be covering shortly. Uh, and the protocol changes a little bit because it's harder to collect pollen from the field trees. So I'll touch on that in just a moment. 
Um, the other question, can you take off the whole catkin and freeze it? Um, I, I think some people have done this. Um, again, um, this protocol was developed around the time that we couldn't afford to do that because we were just getting a few Darling 58 trees that were able to flower. And um, we were worried that, you know, um, we wouldn't be getting as much pollen because the catkin develops um, not all at the same time. Like all the canth anthers aren't ready all at once. It's kind of like a, a sequence. So they'll, they'll mature most at the base of the tree. And then over the, of the span of like a week, it'll flush out along the length of the catkin. So if you waited until um, the catkin was in full bloom, you might miss some of the viable pollen that's at the base. Um, without doing the collections then. So that's probably part of the reason why we have not tried that technique, but some people do. They, they freeze whole catkins, they dry them and freeze them? I've heard, I've heard of it. Uh, oh. think so. Yeah, and I know okay. it was about at, like when we were developing like an experiment to test all this and then we decided against it because it was the catkins were too precious. <laughs> yeah, um, Anthony asks, is there a special wavelength or combination of wavelengths that maximizes the growth rate? And I imagine that's of catkins, not trees, vegetative growth. Yeah, I, I think that's probably what they'd be asking. Um, with chestnuts, I think having the um, red light or far red light is best for flowering, but it's been a while since I revisited that subject. So I can't say for sure. And I don't know exactly what wavelength it is, but Basically what we're using, and I think what Tom's using at UNE is marijuana growth lights. <laughs> like the, generally, and I know this is like not scientific at all, but generally the more expensive they are and the better they are, the better they work. And that tends to be what we've found as well. So thank you, hemp <laughs> commercial industry, because that's made it a lot more accessible and easier to put them into growth rooms. Yeah, um, I should note that, um, the flowering originally, like before Darling 58 was even brought into the pollinations, um, the chestnuts flowered by accident in the highlight growth chamber. So this was not like an experimental trying to figure out what um, wavelength or what intensity of light was best. This was kind of like a serendipitous situation. So we just kind of kept what the growing cycle was on and um, ran with that. So we didn't look too much at the color spectrum of the lights and more just that they were really getting blasted with light way more than normal. And also their day length was of light was increased. Um, so we were just like, hey, works for us. And we kept with that. <laughs> yeah, cool. It's, it's always nice when you have a, a, a nice uh, accident, a, a happy accident there. Yeah. Um, Anthony says far red infrared is what you want. Thanks, Anthony. Yeah. And I have two more questions that I want to ask during this round. One is, does it help to rub the slide to increase the static electricity and capture more pollen? Maybe, actually, that's probably a good idea. I haven't thought about that, um, but something to, to test. Take, take the slide to carpet, you know, rub your feet yeah, on like it. In your hair. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and then one more question, Tim Eck asks, why not just vacuum pollen into a cyclone dust collector? Um, I have done that. I set up a modified um, Black and deck Decker um, cordless vacuum, and I used to freeze it on plankton net. It was actually a net that um, marine biologists use to sample really tiny little crustaceans in the ocean. So it was it would um, remove the cat hen. There was a two layer filter system where I'd re it would remove the anthers and then caught on the on the plankton net was the grains of pollen. Um, and this was nice because it did a great job of collecting pollen, but um, then it was trapped on this like uh, malleable net, which was not great for bringing it out to the field. It was too difficult to transfer the pollen um, from, a, from a, like a fabric surface, I guess. Cool. Well, thanks. Uh, there's still plenty of questions, but I think we'll stop there. And, and thanks for letting me interrupt you. And yeah, let's let's see what else you got. Okay. And please feel free to interrupt me at any time. I tend to start babbling with, um, I go like, get all excited about pollen and whatnot. Okay, so back to pollen freezing. 
Um, this was a big question, part of my master's thesis, to make sure that both negative 20 degree freezers and negative 80 degree freezers will keep um, pollen viable for pollinations. Um, so this figure was examining um, the type of jar that we were collecting in using a screw top vial versus one of those screw top slide jars, different periods of desiccation. And then of course the two different temperatures of freezer, the negative 20 and negative 80. And I did um, have this, oop, these were stored for, I wanna say nine or 10 months in freezer. Um, so I did all this collections, did all the storage of everything, um, did all the viability testing, which Eric will be covering in a moment to find out that nothing was statistically significant as far as these pollen treatments. So, um, we pretty much found that um, whether you're in the negative 20 or the negative 80 degree freezer storage, both will be fine. Um, both will keep your pollen viable around 30 to 40%, which is kind of like the commercial standard for crop growers. Um, this was good to see in particular because most people don't have access to a negative 80 degree freezer. That's typically only found in like labs and stuff. Um, so especially when we um, share pollen and everything, seeing that could be stored at the lower temperatures was really good. So um, now we'll kind of cover what collecting pollen from the trees um, in the field is like, or at least the method that ESF uses. I know that there's probably people in the audience that have done this before, have their own methods. This is just what we found has worked for us. Um, and I'd be happy to chat and kind of brainstorm ideas. But to, before we get into this, um, we'll go over a bit what to look for from the trees. Um, so this is what it looks like in early June, typically with New York. Um, the Southerners in the audience, as Cassie mentioned earlier, like Lasane in Virginia right now, you guys are probably approaching this level of flower development. This is kind of what our, um, probably it says early June here, but this is probably more like mid June um, where we see the flowers are still juvenile. They're not um, opening up and producing that like fuzzy look. They're kind of ropey and really green uh, and this is also probably a good time to bag female flowers because we can begin to see the um, emergence of those styles from the female flowers. What's really nice about chestnut is that the flowers are born on New Year's on New Year growth, so they're not they don't set um, their flower buds on like last year's lignified tissue. So I always when I'm doing the when I'm preparing for pollinations and bagging the trees, I always like my line of sight goes right to the end of the end of the. Um, branches to spot the catkins. They're very easy to see. It's typically how people do their, how people identify chestnuts is because it's very distinctive um, and we look for the flowers. So some of you right now are probably getting close to this stage and we're, we're quite a bit of ways off right now in New York. The catkins are probably, you know, like a inch or so. They're, they're very juvenile. So of course you don't want to collect pollen or remove any catkins at this stage. <laughs> Here's a bit of an up close peek um, at what the end of a branch would look like. As Cassie mentioned, it has those two different flowers, the completely male catkin um, that's usually below, um, lower on the branch, and then the female or the bisexual catkin, which has the female, and then the end of it produces pollen and anthers here. Um, these guys are usually right at the top of the branch. So in New York, um, the last week of June and into early July is when the catkins open up and they just they um, exhibit that really nice fuzzy appearance. I like to call it the fuzzy caterpillar stage. Um, they're uh, again really distinctive. This is premier pollen collection from the field. If you're doing um, collections, if you wanted to try collections from a chestnut tree, um, this is what you want to look for, that creamy, yellowy color. Um, some other good indications that your tree is ready to um, retrieve pollen from is that the catkin will be slightly damp almost to the touch, 
Whereas later in the season when the pollen has been shed entirely and anthesis is over, it'll be, have kind of like a dried crispy feeling. With fresh catkins, you can really feel like that, that water content of the pollen still there. Um, they'll also be highly fragrant. As many of us know, the um, chestnut produces a distinct odor. That is the nectar um, coming off of the, um, uh, the male flower. Uh, that is also a good ind indication that they are in bloom and ready for pollen dispersal. And you also see a lot of insect activity. That's a good clue too. There'll be tons of beetles, flies, bees kind of buzzing around um, near the catkins. So in late July in New York, and again, this is, will be, would be earlier or later, depending on where you are in the country, um, it's, it's too late for pollen collections typically. You might get a little bit of it, but once they turn this like dark brownish golden color, um, you're gonna get very little pollen collected from these guys. So again, you wanna, you wanna collect them when they are uh, flushed out like this, nice and creamy in color. And then once you start to see that brown color though, um, it might be too late. Another thing to look out for is catkins that exhibit male sterility. Um, this typically is found in commercial cultivars or complex hybrids. Um, so for example, like Bouche de Batazac, which is a um, common chestnut cultivar, cultivar, which is a complex hybrid. Um, I think Colossal Chestnut might be a male sterile variety. Um, Maron Duvar, which is a European tree, is male, male sterile, I believe. Um, this is often a desirable trait actually in agriculture because if you have a tree that's not producing much pollen, you know, you can regulate, you know, um, what, 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 what trees are fathering the um, chestnuts that you want to produce. And also um, the tree can spend more energy on producing a nut crop rather than putting energy into producing male flowers. I personally have never seen a male sterile, just normal wild type American chestnut. Let me know in the comments or the chat if you guys have ever come across this. It, um, I've, I've only seen it with our hybrids that we have at our research station. Um, so I've never been like working with a tree and been like, oh, this looks to be male, male sterile. But typically what you'll find is that inst instead of the chestnut being in this fuzzy caterpillar stage, <laughs> I like to call it, or having the filaments with the anthers, the like beads, you know, like looking like this, doesn't have that hairy appearance. Um, they produce very few anthers and filaments that emerge. And then th because there's so few anthers coming out of some of them, there's a significant reduction of pollen production. So even though pollen's being produced, it's just not produced in like a meaningful amount to contribute to fertilizing other female flowers. Um, sometimes they'll kind of look um, almost like they're still juvenile um, catkins, but they'll change color a little bit. So this is actually a, um, a better image. Um, you can see these chestnuts look like they're almost still um, uh, juvenile, but when you look up close at them, they're, they're fuzzy and you just won't see any filaments or anthers really emerging from them. So that's something to, to keep a lookout for. Obviously, you don't want to do pollen collections um, from a male sterile tree, especially if you're someone that um, tends to grow complex hybrids or commercial varieties. It's just something to be aware of. So here's ESF's methods for collecting pollen from the fields. Um, we use microscope slide collection, um, similarly to how we collect pollen from indoors. The big thing here though, is that collecting pollen on a microscope slide directly from a tree out growing outside in the field will not work or it's very difficult, at least in my experience. That is because um, trees that are growing outside obviously are exposed to wind and bugs and other elements that will take the pollen away. So when we're growing pollen indoors um, in these happy little growth chambers and grow rooms, there's no external variables that are contributing to the pollen being shed. It, it, if anything, it will just naturally fall off. Um, so when we collect from the field, from, the, from indoors, it comes off really easily under the slides. 
But with the field trees, as soon as those pollens are mature and cracking up from the anthers, they're taking off. So we have to add in a step here, um, which is removing the catkins from the tree. So this is how traditional pollen collection is done. Um, this was modified from like the standard collection methods that have already been described by TACF. We just put our little twist on it because we, were, we wanted to use microscope slide collection and freezer storage for this process. Um, so to begin this, we cut the catkins off of the tree um, where, wherever is possible if we're working with smaller trees. We'll use ladders and we'll delicately snip off or pull off the catkins rather than cutting whole branches. Um, at ESF at our research stations, we have a lot of blight, a lot of virulent blight, virulent. Um, so especially during the um, flowering time, like we don't wanna, we wanna minimize the, the chance of blight getting into the branches where flowers are gonna be um, so that we can, you know, keep the female flowers nice and healthy. So wherever we can, we'll snip off the catkins from the trees and then put them into a container to be brought back into the lab. Of course, this is um, trickier if you have a really tall tree. Um, and then usually you do have to cut the branch and bring the whole branch in that has like the big heads of catkins on the end. We have done that as well. So this is what our catkins look like when we bring them back into the lab. Um, we, you know, leave it on the bench top. Um, Typically this is done, like at the end of the day, we'll collect the pollen and we'll leave it overnight for about 16 hours. Um, and leaving it on the bench um, allows those anthers, as I mentioned, to keep cracking open and letting the pollen kind of come out more so that more of it comes out um, rather than if you were just trying to collect right from the field. This also gives the pollen like a little bit of time to naturally dry a bit, especially if you're gonna be freezing it. One thing to note that if you wanted to try your own catkin collections, um, you wanna bring it inside, of course, so that the pollen is not being um, exposed to the wind. However, um, you might wanna do it in your garage or maybe even the basement. Um, the catkins have a lot of bugs still on them. You'd be surprised how many tiny little beetles and earwigs and other sorts of critters, uh, thrips, um, live inside of these catkins. So it's, <laughs> you probably wouldn't want to bring your catkins onto the dining room table to do their drying out. Just a little pro tip there. Yeah, so here's what like a collection from some of the larger trees that we couldn't reach. So as you can imagine, there's spiders and there's a whole little ecosystem that chestnuts foster and you'll bring that ecosystem in with you. After the um, catkins are um, done kind of drying out and opening up, we process them by holding the catkin up over a mesh sieve over here in the left. And we just very gently rub the catkin lengthwise and try to knock off all of the anthers. A lot of times the um, filaments will come off too. The mesh sieve um, blocks like bigger chunks of the catkin from falling off and getting into your mixture. And then after you process however many catkins you wanna process, um, the pollen mixture, which is over here to the right, is gathered into a vial. I, like, I call it a mixture because what you're seeing here is not the pollen grains. These are all of the anthers and a lot of filaments. So it's all those accessory floral organs. It's, you're basically collecting all of the, the part of the stamen as Cassie outlined here in this mixture. Um, the pollen you typically can't see. You'll see like little traces of it on the, if you're using a razor blade or even on your, on your hands or on the table. But this part here is mostly just the anthers that you're seeing. We transfer them into scintillation vials that look like this. Sometimes there's little um, chunks that get in there. But again, these are all the anthers. We like to use these scintillation vials if you wanted to try freezing on a, in vials instead of on microscope slides. Again, having something with the screw top uh, jar is good for freezer storage. And here you can see um, just how much anthers can be released after you're done processing. This was from that big batch of field um, catkins that we brought in. Uh, so it's a lot of work, but they, the, the chestnuts are remarkable. They do produce a lot of male flowers. <laughs> So the next stage after you have those vials um, or any sort of jar um, with a small mouth opening, we use this um, time before it gets put into freezer, the freezer storage 
to transfer it onto a microscope slide. And this is where our methods vary a little bit from the traditional um, pollen collection protocol is that we still like to use our microscope slides because, because we like the slide jars and we like having those to bring out to the field. So what we'll do is we'll take the vial that we collected that pollen mixture in, we'll hold microscope slides over the slide jar, uh, over the vial, and then we'll, we'll kind of cap them together and then shake really vigorously. Um, and then the, the vial will leave this nice little pollen sphere or circle, I mean, um, left on the microscope slide that you can see really easily. And part of the reason why we like the microscope slides is that the um, only the pollen gets collected, similar to how we do it with the indoor collections. There's um, very little to no anthers or filaments that get in the way. So this is really ideal for pollinating. Um, you know, you're just applying the pollen and none of the other flower parts are getting in the way of the female flowers. So after we transfer the pollen onto the microscope slides, we freeze them and we prepare them for freezer storage in the same way as the other microscope slides. We keep them for 24 hours with those desiccation rocks in the refrigerator at four degrees Celsius for about 24 hours. And then same thing, they get put in those slide jars and the lid is screwed tight and it's frozen until use. Um, and here you can see all the um, jars prepared. Um, I put this in because you can, if you wish, um, you can freeze them in the jars itself rather than transferring them onto the microscope slide. We don't really do this anymore though because we found that if you freeze the vial, then you have to bring the vial with the microscope slide out to the field and then you're trying to transfer the pollen onto the microscope slide and it's hot and then you drop it. And so just to minimize one of the step and get this little step out of the way, we transfer onto the microscope slide and then freeze rather than freezing in these, in these scintillation jars. Okay, so after um, we do all this pollen collection, we wanna make sure that our pollen that we've collected and freezer stored is remaining viable. So I will be turning it over now to Eric so that he can describe our, the pollen viability testing process. Well, Eric, before you do that, I, I've got a backlog of questions here, Hannah. So before, <laughs> before you run off, let me, let me get to some of these questions. Um, do you have a problem with mealybugs? Mealybugs, are those the ones that um, look kind of like the little scale, scaly guys in the growth chamber? Oh, no. I get my pests confused. Um, if they're the ones that I'm thinking of, we haven't had a problem with those knock on wood in quite some time. Um, our biggest pests that we um, deal with are spider mites, powdery mildew, and fungal gnats. Those are the Same big here. three that we're constantly managing. Mealybugs. I, I, I think we've had infestations of those in the past, but not recently, thank God. <laughs> yeah. Um, how far can wind carried pollen travel? Weather patterns in the spring often blow up the Mississippi Valley from the south. I've heard varying um, reports on this. I've heard that they, it can carry far, but it's most effective within 100 feet. Um, but pollen is widely, can be widely dispersed. Um, but I think there's, you know, debates on the exact distance for that so i'm not sure well i mean because insects carry it too so they can certainly ex, ex i've heard that a quarter mile is the effective pollination yeah. distance but it can certainly i mean it depends on wind breaks and the direction of the wind and if it's raining and like all this kind of stuff as to how far it'll actually go at esf we're actually setting up a pollination um distance experiments. So a new grad student, I think, is going to be working on that, where we're using those male sterile cultivars, as I mentioned, and then having, you know, sequences of trees extending from pollen that are a tree that's pollen fertile and seeing, you know, what gets pollinated the further you go out. So that that will help answer that question, like, pretty effectively. Yeah, and so Tim Eck chimes in here that he had an orchard full of male sterile plants that uh, Bob Leffel and some others had had developed a kind of plan, but because blight resistance is so complicated, it inherited so so much more complicated than we expected, that those plants still survive. Um, just so folks know, if you take an American chestnut female and you put Chinese chestnut male pollen onto that female, most most of the time, 
you're going to get a male sterile F1. So if you want to make some male sterile individuals, that's how you do it. Um, Frank asks, how do you know if you are saving the pollen of trees of good form if you are forcing them for pollen at a young age? And also, can all chestnut trees be forced to shed pollen? That's a good question. Um, so ESF kind of uses a few different um, methods of inducing pollen um, in these trees, one of which is using tissue culture. So we um, what can go out and during like summer we'll say oh this tree is exhibiting really good blight resistance or this tree has really good growth pattern um, and it could be you know four five six years old um, we have the ability to kind of phenotypically do those selections by using tissue culture so we can go out clip the trees in the winter just a couple branches from them and put them through tissue culture and then we use tissue culture trees to kind of stress the trees into producing pollen. We also just sometimes um, add um, seedlings from trees that we got lots of crosses from being like, oh, we haven't used um, this mother tree lineage yet in the breeding program. And so sometimes we'll use seedlings to produce um, uh, the, in the pollen production way, but we use uh, mainly tissue culture plants at ESF and then we mix in seedlings also. Um, Yvonne asks, if someone is collecting pollen and you want to keep the trees separate, what's the best way to separate collected catkins to make sure they're not, you know, contaminating one another? Yeah, I would do them on different days if, if you can. Um, the nice thing about chestnuts is that they don't all, at least at our research station, is that they seem to vary a little bit. So you can monitor the which ones you want to collect from, maybe do it on different days. If that's too big of a pain, pain in the butt. Um, I would just do a really good job. Maybe wear latex gloves, um, wash your hands really well in between labeling, of course, um, and maybe do it in separate areas too. So there's not, you know, drafts or anything that are, that are mixing it. What, um, what do you collect them in? So Yvonne says maybe big Tupperwares for each group. I, we just use pollination bags, but I don't know if you guys have any more. How do, what do you put the catkins in when you're collecting yeah, we use pollination bags if we're just collecting like a little cluster. And then we used actually in that one picture I showed of like all of those branches and stuff, we used like one of those brown paper nursery bags. But you can really use any vessel um, to collect them um, because either, either way, the pollen's gonna get knocked off a little bit in transport. So there isn't, at least in my opinion, there's no like perfect transport container. <laughs> There's a bunch more questions. I want to ask you two more before Eric takes it over. Um, Frank asks, did you say the female flower is fragrant? Is it fragrant all day? Well, first, is the female flower fragrant? No. No. Okay. So then I think the rest of his question is is um, moot because I, that, that was my understanding that the female flower is not fragrant. The male flower absolutely is. And he raises a stink. Um, how uh, Joseph asks, how many slides can you currently produce? How many flowers does a slide pollinate? How great is the risk of licking up blight fungal, oh, probably picking up blight fungal spores? Hold that question because I actually have some like commonly asked um, uh -huh. questions at the end. So okay. we'll get to that. All right, excellent. Thank you so much, Hannah. And everybody keep your questions coming. Eric, please take it away. No, oh, thanks. Can you show your screen, Hannah? Can you show that slide that you were showing a minute ago? Anna, did you hear, hear are you trying to share, share your screen again? Oh, did you, did you want me to share? Yeah, if you can. Um, I can use it clicking. Bit. Sorry, your voice is um, oh. much quieter on my microphone compared to everyone else's for oh, some reason. Sorry. Oh, that's fine. Okay, so I'll go to the next uh, slide from here. Yeah. So I want to give Hannah credit for this, the viability test for the, the test we used I got from her. And um, so as you can see uh, from this, from the photograph, which is actually pretty neat. I like these um, 
super close in photographs of pollen grain. Um, pollen grain lands on the female flower or is transferred by an insect. And the tube transfers the gamete down to the female flower and fertilizes the egg cell and becomes a chestnut. Um, pretty basic there. Um, can you show the next slide? Yep. So in a minute, we'll show an image of the flake where you show the viability. But I really like this. It's the first, uh, or this week was the first time I've seen um, this slide. And I really like the electron, uh, electron microscope photos because even with a really good microscope, you certainly can't see this type of detail. And I think it's really neat um, how pollen grains at this scale look so different um, from different species. And of course, these are chestnut pollen and they're tubes. But um, I think uh, images like this are very interesting to me, probably because I've always had poor eyesight and being able to see things that nobody can see seems cool to me. <laughs> Um, can you show the next one, please? So we make the plates. It's kind of similar to how you would grow Phytonectria, but in this case, you want to show uh, induce pollen germination. And um, so the plate, the, the, the agar in the plate, contains sugars, regular sugar, but it also contains trace minerals. And um, two of the most important are that have been found is calcium and boron are very important to stimulate pollen germination. If you don't have these trace elements, you do get some pollen germination, but it increases a lot when you have uh, tiny amounts of these minerals present um, to help the, the pollen germinate. Um, I've only done this a few times, um, but I will say and you know, in addition to Hannah's earlier comment that I tested some pollen that had been in our freezer, we have a negative 80 freezer for five years and got really good germination of that, like 40% of the pollen grains germinated. So storing it at negative 80 could certainly keep it a long time. And as I was uh, working on this um, or thinking about this chat, I remember the first year that I was here, a gentleman appeared here at Medical Research Farms and he said, I've got some pollen that I've stored on liquid nitrogen. And he had actually collected that pollen 20 years prior when the, from here, from the research farm, and had stored it on liquid nitrogen, which is almost negative 200. And he stored it for 20 years. And then he just kind of showed up one day and said, hey, can I try this? So we used that pollen on some trees here. Uh, I was a new employee, so I didn't do it myself, but um, we pollinated some trees with that pollen that was 20 years old and it worked. So uh, freezing it can apparently, uh, at some level, can last a, a really long time. Of course, if you prepare the pollen, you know, desiccate it properly, um, it's a good way to store chestnut pollen. Um, so if you, you know, if you want to get your um, estimate of your viability, you just count the number of grains. We're going to draw a grid pattern on the bottom of your slide or have a grid pattern. Count the number of grains within a uh, section of that grid and then how many have pollen tubes. And you can, of course, get an estimate of, uh, of uh, how many actually germinated, what percentage actually germinated. Can you show the next, please? So this is kind of what it looks like. This is not a picture from us, but it, it kind of looks like this under our microscope. We can, you know, zoom in at about this level and you notice some of them uh, may have germinated and grow down into the, the agar. But um, so those would be a little bit harder to see. But you can usually see pretty easily um, the ones that are formed pollen tubes and the ones that are not. Uh, next, please. Now, this is what I was describing earlier. Um, those that produce the pollen tube and total number in the grid gives you that uh, percentage. 
Um, for the few that I've done, we've had, as I said, very high 30, 40 percent um, germination using uh, the technique that, that uh, Hannah shared with us. Next, please. Um, so are there any, any questions on the viability, I guess, if there are any in the q and I'll try to answer those or maybe someone else can. I guess I could look through the QA. Oh, I see this um, last question in the QA, or the one that I can see, is about the uh, flower being pregnant. And um, of course, we see a lot of insects on flowers here, you know been here um, nine years doing control pollinations every year. And I looked into it and noticed that on, on our trees, you see a lot of soldier beetles. And then I found a paper uh, a few years ago about European chestnut, and they found that um, soldier beetles were one of the more common pollinators of chestnut flowers, because it's a different species in Europe. But in the same family, we have a lot of those. So I feel like, um, at least partially, that this that those are one of the pollinators of chestnut trees in the U.S. Just because I find so many of those on the flowers during the time that I'm collecting pollen. Of course, there are many other insects find as well. So there might be multiple species that are pollinating or transporting pollen to um, the trees. Yeah, I have um, just to chime in there um, about why male flowers are fragrant and do they um, have any purpose. Um, there's more and more evidence coming out uh, showing that insects um, contribute significantly to pollen production. Oops, I'm to go back. Ah. Um, but one thing that's really cool, and it's kind of an argument in the pro insect, um, insect pollinated pollinations for chestnut, is that chestnuts have one of the rarest um, flowering patterns in the plant kingdom, I guess, um, where it produces the male flowers and then the female flowers become viable. And then the ends of the male of the bisexual flower um, become viable. So that's typically a flowering pattern that's seen when insect um, insects contribute to pollinations is that because the flowers are kind of attract the male flowers on the bisexual catkin are um, attracting insects to try to pass over the female flowers. So it's thought that that um, really strange flowering sequence could contribute to um, pollinations, fertilizations from insects, and possibly also the reason why they're fragrant is because they want those insects to be interacting with, with the plant. And I, when you mentioned that, I was thinking of, you know, earlier when I'm talking about collecting pollen, um, sometimes you can, if the purely male flowers are past the, the best stage since the uh, bisexual cat can produce pollen, Later, sometimes you can get some pollen off of those um, when the male catkins have uh, already um, produced pollen. Because the bisexual catkins are usually several days or maybe a week later that they produce some pollen. So if you if you are late in collecting, you might be able to get some from those catkins. But it's always better to get it at that perfect time. So it might be useful information. Before you guys get too far, um, Eric, do you know, or Hannah, do you know the percent viability for fresh pollen? Um, I have tested fresh pollen in the various like um, studies I did for my master's thesis work. 
it varied pretty significantly. Sometimes it would be close to like 80, 90%. Sometimes it was around 50, sometimes it was around 70. The main thing to note with pollen viability analyses is that they are just estimates. Um, we're essentially kind of like tricking the pollen into thinking it landed on a female flower, but sometimes the conditions just aren't right or the pollen wasn't collected at quite the right stage of pollen development. Or for whatever reason, maybe like the tube was just really slow and didn't produce as quickly as the other ones. Um, so that that uh, number varies. Um, I have a slide actually on that shortly too. Um, but yeah, keep in mind that if you were to test your pollen and you saw that it was only 20% viable, that's just an estimate. Typically we see when we use that in the fields that seed set, that's the true measure of pollen viability. And um, it's more viable than we when we put a number on it, I guess, um, using these viability in vitro um, tests. Yeah. Um, I have several questions from Margaret Allen, so I want to pass those along to you. So Margaret wants to know what your desic desiccation time is. How long does it take to desiccate? That was one of the um, parameters that we tested when we were doing these pollen storage experiments. We tested a four, a 24, and a 48 hour um, desiccation period before going into the freezer. We found that there was no significant difference between a four hour and a 48 hour period. But after, once you got to the 48 hours, we saw a decrease when we did those in vitro germination analyses. So to keep things simple, we do 24 hours just because it's very easy to set our timer. Um, it's easier to forget about them when they are on the four hour um, desiccation time. Um, sometimes like on a Friday though, or uh, you know, when we aren't gonna be in the next day, we'll use the four hour, but pretty, uh, it's pretty standard that we use the 24 hour period. Okay, Margaret also wants to know, um... Do insects eat the pollen or are there any insects that are reliant upon chestnut pollen? Do we know that? Oh, hmm. This is getting more into my, into the entomology, which I'm not super familiar, familiar with. Um, I know that my honeybees that we have out at our research station eat the pollen. Um, they use it, they make it into a bee bread, they ferment it, and then they can store it in their hive. You guys have um, any honeybee knowledge. Um, I'm sure other insects do. I'm sure other insects are pollen feeders um, or nectar feeders or a combination of the both. Um, so I don't know that we have any good, I haven't seen any studies or anything on that, but um, I'm, it, it may exist. Yeah, I haven't seen it because it crosses over into the insects and I'm like, that's a whole kind of other world. My knowledge right. is pretty much honeybees and then I don't know I can like identify things. I'm like, that is a ladybug. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's an ant. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, Margaret also wants to know, are there any fungi or mold that attacks the pollen? I mean, I think when it gets, when it gets dried pretty well, I don't see anything that really affects it. And then in, in all of your pictures, I don't know, Eric, in any of the viability studies, have you ever seen, or Hannah, have you seen anything any mold or anything? I think the drying does a really great job of keeping that stuff at bay. Yeah, and the in, in vitro um, ones that we do, um, because you're applying a non-sterile pollen, regardless, the, the slides are non-sterile, the pollen itself obviously is non-sterile. When we do the in vitro analyses, because we're incubating something that was non-sterile on an agar plate at like 80 something degrees Celsius, um, we see fungi then and we'll see that's why we do the analyses about 24 hours later because if we were to let it go and you were to look at that plate in like two days it's going to be fuzzy the whole plate is going to be fuzzy and filled when you look at it on the microscope there's like mycelia and like all these strands um i've never seen it though like when we pull out from the freezer to use in pollinations i've never seen any sort of like mold or moisture issue i guess that would contribute to to fungi hanging out in there um, Fred Berenger wants to know, I lost his, his question in here. Uh, do you ever have problem? Oh, does pollen fall off the slide during storage and does it help to store the slides horizontally? Also a good question. Um, as I mentioned, they are kind of, they kind of work together that the slide has a little bit of a sticky quality to it. Um, and then if it's nice and electrically charged, not too much falls off 
once it's on the slide, you do see a little bit of the pollen kind of coming off of the catkin just when you like disturb it a little bit with the slide. So that's that contributes a little bit to pollen loss. But once it's on the microscope slide, it stays there pretty well. Um, and I know you have a lot of FAQs, but the last question, just because I know we're, we're about to, we, we got 19 more minutes, but just so we get to it, I've had several people ask, where are we with D58 deregulation and when can I have some trees? <laughs> the, the most popular question, of course, yeah. um, whenever Darling 58 gets brought up. Um, so it is my understanding that we are still um, anticipating a decision from the USDA possibly um, at the end of the summer or into fall. But um, the USDA has been kind of quiet. It's hard to get in touch with them. So we haven't heard any recent update from them. They've been, it's, they've been kind of like um, out of touch with us in, uh, in the past couple of months. So that's still our estimate, but we can't say for sure when approval is gonna be. Um, it's all up to the government at this point. So um, just trying to get to approval first and then force eventually distributions. I know we, we were hopeful that this would come in time for possible pollinations this season, but that, that sounds like it's pretty pretty well not, not going to happen. So um, I think definitely don't expect any, any pollen this season um, unless you have a permitted site. Um, you know, maybe next year we can do pollen and, and maybe still some potential to distribute seedlings in the fall, but that even that's still, I think, in question. One thing that I, I, was, I was talking with Andy about this morning, and I think I want to pass along to you guys, you know, this is this is regulatory stuff. And a lot of times um, that can get political. And so if you want this to move along, be nice and write a nice letter, a nice assertive letter to your local and uh, federal and state representatives about how you'd like this to be happen. Because, I mean, I, I know politicians really want to listen to their constituency. So um, I think we're going to work on uh, with ESF, TACF on maybe some language that you guys can use. Um, to send to your local legislatures that maybe they can push on some of the regulatory agencies to to make this decision a little bit more swiftly. Um, but uh, so, but if you already have relationships with your local and federal and state politicians, please feel free to bring this up and just say, "Look, I've been waiting for this. Um, can you do anything to help move this along?" Uh, uh, Margaret says, now that I'm retired, I can try to influence politicians. Yes, <laughs> do that. And this is a good, nice bipartisan cause. Um, so that's where we're at. Uh, thank you, Hannah. Um, so I think it's time for pollinations and FAQs. Yeah, I have just a few more slides that are kind of just like common questions I get typically about pollinations and like the procedure and everything. Um, so I'll go through that quickly so we have time to chit chat a little bit more. Um, controlled pollinations for people in Syracuse are early. Um, they start like late June, first and second week of July is our big pollination period. So we use a lot of frozen pollen during that time. Um, with all of our collaborators and people like Tom Clack and Cassie at Meadowview and the people that are contributing to sending pollen, we have to send all of our pollen frozen on ice in the mail. And that's because pollen is delicate and um, we don't want it you know, being exposed to really warm temperatures, especially if we're sending things in the summertime. So even if our pollen is, is even if our darling trees and the growth chambers and the rooms are producing pollen you know, in July, we collect them, freeze them, and then store them. Even if they were just collected, they get frozen. Um, so in the future, if we are eventually able to send out pollen, um, either from our darling trees or darling trees that are growing in the fields, they will be sent um, on microscope slides within those slide jars. Uh, so that it makes great for pollinations and also using them in the field. And here's um, one of the questions I was asked earlier about how many flowers you can get out of the pollinate, out of the microscope slides. Um, on average, we counted this year, we labeled every single slide jar and every single um, slide within a slide jar. And we were finding that each slide will pollinate 10 to 20 female flowers on average. Um, each slide jar itself then, if there's four microscopes per slide jar, you can get between 40 and 80 female flowers pollinated. 
Um, and another thing to note is that um, pollen can be stored in a negative 20 or your home freezer until it's used. So when we do our pollen exchange between the people that have permits to be able to do pollinations, um, a lot of people use negative 20 um, degree Celsius freezers that will work just fine. It'll keep your pollen nice and happy until you can, can bring it out of the freezer and start using it on your trees. So here's my common pollen question section of the chat. One I get a lot is that people prefer to use the vials or other mechanisms of um, pollinating. Like I get the dunk method a lot, which is I like having my pollen mixture um, and then using the dunk method, kind of like sticking the flower in and kind of rubbing the um, the flower in the mixture. And this works. Every, a lot of people use this method. A lot of other types of plant breeders use that. Some people use like paint brushes and they kind of brush the pollen onto the plants. Um, the reason why I use microscope slides, as I mentioned, that um, it's very targeted because only the pollen is being stored on those microscope slides. You can see it. You can see it being transferred from the slide onto the stigmas. Um, on the slide, it leaves almost like track marks on the, like you can see where the stigma was rubbed on the microscope slide. And then you can also see if you have good eyesight that the stigmas turn like a golden color after they picked off pollen off of the slide. So we can really see like, wow, that stigma, it turns that gold color. It definitely got a good serving of pollen grains, um, which then we can, you know, surmise that fertilization will occur. Another question I get is fresh pollen better to use than frozen pollen? Um, I, uh, in theory, yes, fresh pollen um, is better. When we do these in vitro analyses that Eric described, I was constantly finding that the fresh pollen was highly viable um, compared to the stored pollen, which was usually around like 30 to 35% viable, where the fresh pollen I was testing was 70, 60, 70% viable. Um, so when, whenever possible, we do like to use um, the pollen that's collected um, from our highlight growth chambers. It's the best when it is um, produced within the range of when pollinations are occurring. So we'll stop at our growth um, chamber before the pollinations begin for the day and we'll do all of our collections and then bring the pollen out to the field. That's awesome, but that does not always work. That's just a stroke of luck if everything times is timed up that way. Um, but over the past year, um, one of my colleagues, Dr. Allison Oaks, um, started looking at our harvest data. And she was finding that from the field results, now, as I mentioned, field results and seed set is a better um, display of pollen viability than doing this, these in vitro analyses. She was finding that our frozen pollen can work just as well as fresh pollen. And we we're finding that we saw seed set from pollen that was over two years old in, these, um, in this analysis. Here's um, kind of a close up uh, or one of the figures from her statistical analysis that she put together. This is looking at the number of um, nuts per flower on the um, Y axis. Um, and then looking at it, each one of these is a different year of the pollination season here. And then the week is like, of course, the week that the pollinations were done. And then the um, little uh, dots on here are showing the difference between frozen and fresh pollen. In some instances, um, frozen pollen way outcompeted <laughs> the fresh pollen. Um, looking over at 2021 and 2022, like they were flip flopping consistently um, as to which one worked better and which one produced the most um, uh, flowers or yeah, nuts per flower. And then in 2022, the most recent one, you can see that they were pretty close in range a lot of times. Um, and this is cool too, as you can see this nice arch when these were probably the trees were a little bit too early to be pollinated and then better. And then we got the best harvest right here at the 28th week of the year and then a slow drop off. And by here is probably a little bit too late to do pollen. So we're seeing more and more convincing evidence that the pollen will um, stay viable for quite some time. Um, so we can keep using pollen that's been stored from previous years so that to make sure that we have enough pollen to go around and get to all the female flowers that we can in our permitted sites. 
Another question is, what if the pollen um, is being used locally? Um, do I need to use free? To, do I need to use dried or frozen pollen um, if trees, if I'm doing it right in the same spot or on the same day? Um, yes, is the quick answer to that. I have done this in the past. Um, sometimes collecting and drying pollen is not practical. Um, for example, this study, the field site was over an hour away and I wanted to do the pollinations a couple days later. So I didn't want to have to drive it back and forth and all that. So we just collected and then used the pollen right away. Um, I have heard in the literature before that um, using slightly dried pollen is better. Um, I'm not sure, I can't speak to that too much um, because when the studies that I've used fresh pollen, I have gotten pretty good seed sets. Um, but to do fresh pollen collections, we use the same protocol of stripping off the anthers from the catkins over a sieve and then transferring them into a scintillation vial. And we've gotten pretty creative doing collections out in the field. You can see my like pile of spent catkins and doing it on a paper plate or the hood of a car like in the previous picture and then we'll bring out these scintillation vials in our microscope slides and we'll do the pollinations right then and there kind of depends on the sequence of flowering um, to like what tree you want to pollinate you got to kind of line up do the female flowers look re um, receptive to be able to do the pollen, pollen collections now um, or should i wait a little bit bring the pollen home dry it freeze it and then bring it back out a later time so you kind of have to um, get comfortable with the flowers and wait and see um, and kind of plan a little bit. But this slide is pretty much just showing you that yes, you can use fresh pollen if you don't want to go through freezing it and everything. You'll still get fertilized seeds using straight from the tree pollen. Um, another question is, do I need to rehydrate pollen after it's been um, on like thawed from the freezer before it can, can be used for pollinations. This is another um, recommendation that people use in the chestnut breeding community and the plant breeding community. And this is because the pollen has been dried and freezer in the freezer. So this is kind of it's like wake up period. I did a quick little analysis on um, the pollen viability after um, after it's been out of the freezer and using like putting the pollen into a container with a little bit of moistened paper towel in the refrigerator and letting it rehydrate and then testing the viability. So four hours had the lowest viability um, and then 24 hours and 48 hours were pretty close. So this like small little study says maybe like it would be good to rehydrate your pollen for a little bit before bringing it outside and using it in the field. ESF abandoned this <laughs> process because it was becoming um, too difficult to have to do all these rehydrate, um, rehydrating when we were trying to like crank out tons of pollinations. I think this um, past summer we hand pollinated like over 17,000 flowers and used like hundreds of pollen vials. So this uh, rehydrate, rehydration period like quickly um, went away, but we do bring our pollen um, slides out in a cooler with ice in it. So we like to think that that's kind of like the rehydrating period, like um, when it's kind of warming up and getting um, warmer in temperature and taking in some moisture. Yeah, time consuming, I put that on there. It, it's uh, But if you're someone that is um, just working with a couple vials of pollen, uh, this is something you could consider doing to kind of give your, your pollen a little boost. I think this is the last question that I have before we, before we're, I'm all done with my slides. But this is a really common one I get is how long do I have to work with the pollen until it's no longer viable? So in this study, I found that we'll still get tubes for quite a while. Um, this is looking at pollen. It's being tested on those agar plates um, every 24 hours after it was um, removed from the freezer. So you'll find that right from the freezer, like taken, no rehydrating, no kept in the, in the refrigerator and put right on the um, plate. And it was pretty viable. So that um, was good to see. And then this figure kind of shows you that within the first two days, you'll want to keep your pollen after it's been removed from the freezer. Um, you'll you'll want to use it. But even after 13 days, we were still seeing tubes. I never got to zero tubes before I ran out of actual pollen to keep testing the sample. Um, so that was kind of cool to see that the, the pollen grains will hang in there. You'll, you'll lose a lot of viability, but they are pretty durable 
um, as long as they remain in the fridge. And one thing to note is that after your pollen has been removed from the freezer, do not put it back in the freezer. Um, Cause obviously you, we go through all of that to dehydrate it, dehydrate it. You wouldn't want it to rehydrate, bring it out to the field, work with it and then be like, oh, we still have some, I wanna, I wanna put it back in the freezer and keep it viable. Don't do that. It could damage the pollen. Um, Keeping it in the fridge will give you, you know, the few extra days <clears throat> to keep working with it, which is pretty cool to see. This picture is a bit hard to see, but it, it was pretty much just showing that even after every time I took pictures of it, I was still seeing, you can see them a little faintly, I was getting tubes. So all the way here on the 13th day, I think it was still tubes. <laughs> they were still ready to do pollinating. So just to wrap everything up, um, if this is something that's interesting to you and you wanna start working with pollen and conducting pollinations, um, definitely give it a try yourself. If you have access to flowering trees, um, try to do this protocol and try you know, applying it to another tree in the area and see um, how you can get comfortable with the process. Sometimes, I don't know if we're gonna be doing it this year, um, pollination kits are available um, from ESF or from TACF. Maybe keep a lookout for that. I don't know if they're being run this year, but that's something to keep your eye on if you do see advertising about pollination kits. Um, and if you just wanna chit chat more about pollinations or pollen or really anything um, in that realm, um, feel free to contact me and I put my email address in here. And I'm sure um, Cassie and Eric would love to chit chat with you guys about chestnuts and pollinations as well. Anna, thank you. We are just about out of time. Uh, so I wanna thank everybody. I have one last question that I wanna ask. Jim English asks, how long is pollen good at room temperature? Like if you just take the catkin out and store it at room temperature. Room temperature. I don't think I've done that before. I think I always use a refrigerator cause I'm worried about keeping it at room temp. But I will say that um, on really long, um, June days, sometimes we run out of ice and our buckets get a little bit warm. So maybe even warmer than room temperature. And um, we saw in those seed set analyses from Dr. Oaks that our seed set is still pretty good at like that premier June time. So I think that they'll be tough. Um, you just wouldn't want to keep them um, for too long at room temperature before. And, and you can keep them in the fridge for a while. You can, I, I think we've kept fresh catkins for a week or more that's where the mold comes in you know if you don't dry them and you just throw them in a bag and you throw them in the fridge but i think viability like viability wise you won't get as good a seed set as the longer it's it's stored in the fridge but you don't have to go through that desiccation and freezer stage um you just don't get as good a results um well thank you guys i really appreciate your time um i want to mention to uh the rest of you guys we have other chestnut chats, Hannah and, and I think Eric have also done, maybe Cassie, you have too. I know you guys have done other pollination chestnut chats that are up in the archives. There are harvest and storage chestnut chats that are up in the archives. And of course, plenty of other, I think we're up to 40 now of these chestnut chats. So plenty of information that's out there. Um, next month in June, June 16th, we'll talk about the documentary. Uh, we'll send out a link for you guys to register for that. Until next month, I hope you all are having a marvelous spring and summer, and we'll see you next month. Thanks so much, you guys. Thank you. Thank you.